temperature stays manageable because the sun is on that side of the building. Um, my name is Marlene Lecker, I'm the director of the Africa Study Center and I'm really happy to be able to welcome you this afternoon um, and especially to be able to welcome Kathy, Kathy Dodworth from Edinburgh. Uh, very welcome. Uh, you will be delivering a seminar on the legitimate it's always a difficult one. I know, I know. I hope you do better <laughs> than I am. Uh, on political practice in Tanzania, um, you'll be speaking for about 30 minutes and then there's sufficient time for questions and answers. I would also like to draw your attention to the book display that we have, book from the library of the Africa Study Center. Um, that relates to the topic that Kathy will be talking to us about. Um, Kathy is a research fellow at the Center of African Studies at the University of Edinburgh, currently working on voluntarism in Kenya, but presenting today on political practice in Tanzania, which is uh, work related to the PhD work that you've done also at the Center of African Studies uh, at Edinburgh University. Kathy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Where are we to stand or can I get leave a sitting? Um, stand, please. Yes. <laughs> Got it. And the heels, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> See how long I make it. So thank you everybody so much. I'm very flattered by this invitation, I have to say, um, to this exciting uh, rebranding Kandaba Day. It's also <laughs> Africa Day, 60, 60 years to the day. Uh, since the um, organization of African Unity was founded. Uh, thank you so much, Rick, for the uh, logistical uh, support, uh, professional support. Um, and yeah, I'm just so happy to be here at the prestigious center, one with a long-standing uh, relationship, of course, with Edinburgh. Um, it's been lovely to be in the Netherlands. I've been greeted, I've got a windmill out my window, the canals. <laughs> And cyclists rule the roads, <laughs> which I'm delighted about because I'm an absolute cycling fanatic. So yes, if you ever return the visit to Edinburgh, I'm sure you get uh, kilts and uh, <laughs> bagpipes, and then if you're interested, a fine more whiskey. <laughs> so yeah, my name's Cathy. I'm originally from um, within politics in IR, um, and that's where I was. I was jointly uh, supervised within the African Studies, but IR is my disciplinary home. And that's where I was when I did this doctoral field work in coastal Tanzania, which I'll go into today. Um, after that, I went into the College of Medicine. So I've been doing social science of medicine, which causes a huge amount of confusion, especially when you're trying to get your next job. Uh, but now I move back to the Center of African Studies and I've sort of fused both of those worlds in a new project, which I'll touch on later. So this book, it's called Legitimation as Political Practice. And it looks like it's about NGOs, and it is, but it's also an attempt uh, to say something more about both state and non-state actors in this particular context in coastal Tanzania. And basically, it's about how development actors get people to do what they want them to do. So now it sounds like a development studies book, and it is, <laughs> but it's not just that, it is an IR, Book. Now I've been challenged on that. I don't know whether you have the same difficulties being interdisciplinary, but it seems like sometimes nobody actually wants you. Um, but I've been told, you know, it's too local. Africa is not relevant to IR. I don't know if you've ever come across that. Um, but also, you know, NGOs, nobody really cares about NGOs on the global stage. But I've been trying to capture something that I think is missing in international relations debates. And that's whereby discussions around non-state actors and legitimacy or legitimation practices only interested in NGOs insofar as they confer legitimacy to those intergovernmental organizations. Their legitimacy is always assumed. It pre-exists those debates. So I'm interested in these practices all the way down. 
those NGOs that confer legitimacy to the EU or elsewhere, how do they build theirs in the first place? This book is a result of fieldwork started uh, over a decade ago now. I'm a slow mover. Uh, it's almost never written. Originally, I was very interested uh, in a more sort of formal sense of legitimacy, how an NGO was constituted formally. Did that translate in some way to perceive legitimacy on the basis or on the part of the populations that they're working with? Ripped that up year one, um, and I'll come back to why. Almost never read because I became extremely unwell after my son was born in 2016, to the point where it took a couple of years before I was able to literally to read and write again. It's not something I shy away from. It's right there in uh, the preface or the, uh, yeah, the preface and acknowledgement. Uh, so it's, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. Also almost not written because of COVID. So uh, I'm sure many of you in this room really struggled, grappled in that time, competing responsibilities. There's a lot of other people's labor going into this book. Often that's invisible, especially on the childcare side. So with all of that, it's hard to believe I'm on this kind of uh, rock and roll tour of <laughs> Europe over the last <laughs> few weeks, but you know, I'll take it. I'm here proud and delighted to be in conversation with you all. So apparently we're in a, a crisis of legitimacy. Okay, so I'll give you an example. House Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she said so, so she set it out in a thread uh, on Twitter last year after the US Supreme Court overturned federal abortion rights. Firstly, that court's opinion no longer reflects broader public opinion. Secondly, perhaps more fundamentally, trust in the court itself is at an all time low. Similar crises of legitimacy everywhere in the UK at the moment, we're talking about the Metropolitan Police, public trust for the first time in a while has dropped below 50%. So this I sometimes call the Tinkerbell effect. Institutions are no longer legitimate because people no longer believe in them. And there's some Viberian inspired work going on in the background here where legitimacy is similarly defined firstly as a shared belief and often, and including in IR studies, not just a shared belief in appropriateness or rightfulness, it's a belief in legitimacy of that particular institution. And that is still defined um, more recently in uh, IR debates. So whether or not I agree with AOC's politics, and I do, but personally, after many years of studying legitimacy, I've moved away from what I call the attributive brand, so that something is either legitimate or not. And people in political theory, at least, they've been working on that kind for a very, very long time. You could say it's one of the founding debates that we have in political theory. So yes, the number of flow charts and causal diagrams I try to digest as people aspire to give a very exhaustive account of legitimacy and all of its causal variables. But I mean, why? Like, how does that actually translate to the everyday? Because there's a couple of things that have become apparent to me. Firstly, who uses the word legitimacy? Well, academics, we like to talk about that. Political commentators and politicians will wield the word as well. But secondly, perhaps epistemologically more uh, fundamental, understanding legitimacy as a shared belief and in legitimacy is almost impossible to research. So I don't think we speak in those terms. I don't think we think in them either. So we might talk about trust, we might talk about fit for purpose, we might talk about confidence, and then perhaps you retroactively try and link those to legitimacy, but I don't think we feel legitimacy. So I'm not feeling it. I don't spend time forming these sort of conscious stable beliefs about the legitimacy of a particular institution. You know, I don't, other things going on, I'm busy. <laughs> Those who were involved in this research as well, they didn't. So right or wrong of a particular intervention, yes, but around the actual institution, the legitimacy per se, no, not so much. And secondly, obviously, if we spend, if we did, if there was such a thing as a sort of common shared belief, do we hold, are we able to hold such a thing collectively? Probably not. So all of your mediating beliefs, experiences, backgrounds, and so on, barriers to holding a shared belief, 
in the legitimacy of any single institution. But this mythology, I think, this sort of idea of shared belief and a moment of shared agreement, this is the founding story of many of our institutions in the West and elsewhere. Sometimes I call it the ether of political theory in that our current rather westernized transactional idea of politics as uh, as consent between uh, particular institutions, it doesn't make sense without that glue. So we are bound forever to theorize its contents. So before I go into that though, I want to go back a little bit on this idea of crisis. Um, so those in Western democracies apparently experiencing a protracted de uh, deficit in legitimacy, disaffection with political institutions, long-term economic stagnation, weakening norms, new, so termed new non-state actors on the block, but of a crisis of where do they fit into our existing arrangements. So what I suggest in the book, and I'm not the first person to do that, some of these elements deemed a crisis have a long generative history in the colonized world, not least, of course, non-state actors, originally companies, but now NGOs, that are very much part of everyday governing practices of the public and the private. Things that often happen in Africa first in pronounced forms, um, esteemed scholars like Meme argued that, so yes, these sort of more ambiguous ideas of governance and straddling these divides between state and non-state, public, private, global, and local, these are long established in many post-colonial contexts. So do we see crisis or do we see something more like continuity? So throughout the book, I tried to screen for what Stoller would call imperial debris um, regarding legitimacy debates deeming what is a crisis, what is a norm, and even this sort of founding mythology around how institutions are born. The assumption very much in Western scholarship when you read legitimacy studies is legitimacy is there, and then an intervention follows. But in many of these sort of colonial and post-colonial contexts, intervention is the regime. So that's the backdrop to my book. That's why I wrote it, so, so, so sort of spell it out. Firstly, long-standing fixation in Western political philosophy, capturing legitimacy, all of it, all of its causal components. But then what? You know, if something is deemed illegitimate, which is happening a lot at the moment, what stops, what changes? Or do we just see new evolving ways of working? Secondly, rowing back on these liberal enlightenment assumptions, especially this idea of a transaction, a contract between a consenting public and its institutions, this founding moment of consent, did it happen? Did it happen in most of the world? And lastly, one that I haven't touched on yet, legitimation is as much about the audience. So there's a lot of studies out there that look at how particular messages or ideas are transmitted downwards to a rather unwitting audience that just sort of passively consume it. And I include a lot of legitimacy studies in Africa in that. They are your data that will tend to look at uh, speeches, elite fora, including uh, yeah, speeches, media, manifestos, and so on. And I've tried to make my audience as much about uh, the audience as possible. So that's why I did the study and I used practice-based inquiry to do it. But I don't try and fixate too much on definitions, but people like them. But I feel sometimes you can fall into the same traps, really, of, uh, of uh, the same sort of things I'm trying to rule back against around causal models, the cause and effect. But on screen at the moment is my best attempt. It's my working definition to define what I mean by legitimation. I've got a really bad throat, so it's going to be a lot of awkward pauses while I <laughs> rehydrate. So the more I studied, the more I saw legitimation as a set of overlapping practices, practices that imbue power with various ideational material capital, and that power comes, at least momentarily, something like authority. 
But I appreciate nobody uses the word legitimation either. I'm left with something that's even more difficult to say. But I'm not claiming that any of this, this sort of shared belief, and more importantly, not making a moral claim here that something is legitimate or not. So there's no good or bad NGOs in this book. I just use it as the closest term in the literature, but very much divorced from legitimacy. So it's not that you do some legit legitimation and legitimacy pops out. It's more you do some of these embodied practices, you might get some people to do what you want to do some of the time. But it is partial, it's ephemeral, and it involves a constant renegotiation. I did start with NGOs, but I broadened it to look at state actors too, because the overlap between states and non states seems so apparent to the practices, the practicalities, and then even the people themselves uh, begin to overlap, at least in the context where I was looking at. So I started to use this term. Oh, I think we've moved on non-state, non-forward slash state, to try and capture that phenomenon where these practices overlap, but it's still helpful at times when expedient to borrow ideas from both. And I can come back to uh, examples of that. I look at coastal Tanzania, uh, partly there was a, a rush of this sort of non-forward slash state activity in that context at that time. It was 2011 to 2013. President Kikwete was actually from uh, that area in Bagamoyo. So there was a um, definite, there was a rush of registrations of new NGO activity. But then also historically, so you have the colonial history of Tanganyika as a German colony, and then later a, U, uh, a UK or British protectorate, as it were. But then, of course, uh, the very unique sort of post independence journey. Uh, of Ujima and, uh, and socialism, and then a very rapid sort of market liberalization. A lot of these different ideas and materialities are, are still sort of resonating and shaping the developmental landscape. But then within Bagamoyo itself, so the coast became quite marginalized during uh, the sort of anti colonial um, African nationalist movement and rapidly became was used to be um, quite influential and became quite overlooked uh, and this affected things like representational practice which I will come back to. <clears throat> so given the focus on this uh, African this very specific context um, I try, so I do at some point in the, in, the, in the theoretical chapter map how legitimacy has been applied to Africa historically. And here this sort of imperial debris is quite obvious. So some things methodologically I subscribe to Weber, but uh, his three very famous forms of legitimation, you have uh, traditional, charismatic and rational. And it's traditional legitimacy that is still applied quite liberally to African contexts and often subtly contrasted with rational legitimacy, which whether, whether he conceded it or not, it was really for him the more superior kind. A lot of neo-patrimonial analysis, uh, dominant in the 80s and 90s, drew, as we know from this subform, it's a subform of traditional legitimacy. And it was often used to paint a picture of a continent in its infancy with uh, immature or irrational uh, institutions so many problems with this obviously it's uh, racist undercurrents um problematic but i'm going to pick up aside from that on two others so firstly there's no audience there's very rarely any audience in neo-patrimonial analysis okay so again this sort of mute public captivated by this uh, charismatic big man without the sophistication to contest them and secondly money talks so the politics of the belly who eats first but as um uh, and Weary famously wrote uh, recently when taking aim at neo-patrimonialism and its problematic sort of legacy, ideas matter too, and often they matter the most. So most of my book really focuses on the ideas or the collection of ideas that give um, meaning to action. I talk about five of these. So one is the creation of political space boundaries of turfs by non-state, non-forward slash state actors. 
Um, two, I talked about the idea of the state itself, so borrowing authority from the state, uh, in this case, the sort of developmental post-socialist state in Tanzania. Number three, I talked about voluntarism. And number four, I talked about representational practice. And the last one, I talked about materiality, because I can't sort of overlook uh, the political economy, obviously, of, of development in that context. But I look at it in the form of information, of data. So information is obviously a material resource to us now, uh, fungible towards funding and so on. But even then, I talk about how ideas are important in producing and creating that information. It's extraction, it's sharing, uh, and then it's ultimate conversion into funding. A couple of things the book doesn't really talk about. One is religion. Um, party politics is another. Um, these things did operate in the background, but weren't really uh, necessarily uh, yeah, in the foreground as far as um, uh, mapping or shadowing these various development actors. So it could be a bit of a blind spot to the to this book, but I'm going to do uh, today just talk about those three on the top um, and can talk more about some of the other themes in uh, QA if need be. <coughs> but before I do that, I just wanted to say about people are saying, What's the deal with the artwork? <laughs> so um, we just tried to do something a wee bit different with the, with the cover art, trying to capture some of these ideas that I've laid out. Some people hated it, some people liked it. We, you know, we just tried to do something a wee bit different. Uh, we had to tread carefully, obviously, given the very problematic history of uh, representing the African context and essentializing representation, whether aesthetically or politically, often historically, those have been melded. So to push that back against that, we did uh, two things. The first is all of these are based on photographs taken by NGOs themselves, but all with the correct permissions. So in a sense, we're exploring NGOs representations of their own work, so it gets a bit meta. Uh, we used creative ways, as you can see, to protect identities there. Secondly, we promote this young woman, so this audience member, she is our key protagonist. And behind her, this legitimation scene is playing out, the NGO, uh, employee is, is practicing, he's moving around, speaking uh, very performatively. On the, that day he was making superior representation claims on the part of his NGO as compared to other NGOs, but also as compared to local government. The audience is there, they're very much there, they're very much part of it. Some were engaged, some were bored, some liked them, some were laughing at them. Um, He's also sort of, there's an echo or a hint of, of, of space there in the line that he's trying to uh, create, he's trying to draw a boundary around this as a new sort of constituency. But at the same time, he's straddling two worlds, so the sort of urban and the village. He laughed himself later at some of these photos saying how town he looked in the photographs. Um, so some people have interpreted this as again a sort of shadowy, sinister figure, a bit like the African big man that we were trying to push back against. I'm like, no! <laughs> but uh, that was definitely not the intention. It was more that we wanted to foreground this young woman. He was not like that. He was um, much less hierarchical. It was a very different encounter as compared mm -hmm. with local government officials. And the reason we wanted to, uh, to foreground this young woman is this key protagonist. She is a key sort of audience member if she's not convinced at all about the scene that's going on, about whether she wants to join, because I think she understands what's going to be asked of her. And also, she's staring right back at the camera. She's clearly challenging the onlooker's place in that moment. Um, and yeah, the artist, Chris, who first noticed this young woman and drawn to the, the sort of ambivalent expression of humor, but fatigue, ambivalence, they are a very conditional acceptance of this NGO. And you can see uh, interwoven in her kitengi rap there is the word magical, which means responsibilities, which is something that she shouted during a monitoring visit when an NGO employee hadn't turned up for the third day running, so that, you know, magical, I have other things to do. 
Um, so that lets me segue to the first team voluntarism. So apologies for those who were at the class earlier. There's a bit of replication. So this sort of ethic of, of unpaid time towards a common good. A lot of ideas layered into that. So Nyeri socialist legacy, where weekly communal labor was constricted, constricted by the state, uh, which did exist before that, but it's Nyeri's concerted drive towards uh, self-reliance, self-help, this was an explicitly anti-Western move. But then by the 90s and the noughties, you had the sort of rediscovery of voluntarism exported by Western donors, and often through NGOs. Every single NGO I spoke to, they used volunteers to serve particular goals. Um, and then, yeah, volunteers, they do a lot of work for NGOs. So not just the actual labor, they do a, little, a lot of legitimation work as well. They convey the idea of an ability for that NGO to work at scale across an entire village, um, uh, sorry, across an entire uh, county or district depth to go right to the heart of every single village or every single community. And then also there's this idea of consent or validation. So having an NGO, um, a volunteer on your book in some way um, validates or uh, conveys consent for that NGO's particular program. Uh, but yeah, obviously a lot of tensions. It's not that straightforward for those volunteers themselves. Personal benefits, yes, not in dispute, but often they do it and they don't necessarily want to. They didn't necessarily choose to originally. Um, a lot of stories there in the book of, of balls who wanted to stop, they can't. Um, there's one story in particular where um, a volunteer was being grilled during monitoring by an NGO, you know, all of the photos on the village office wall of uh, vulnerable children. And they were saying, well, where's this kid now? Where's the, we need this for reporting. And eventually after a couple of minutes, the woman sat down, the volunteer, and she said, I've been doing this for eight years. I want it to stop. So people can evade work, they can hide, uh, disappear from NGOs and local government. It's difficult though, I think, you know, at least in a, in a more rural setting. So, um, yeah, I also think that the, uh, some of these tensions are apparent in this quote. Another woman, when I asked her, when did you start volunteering? She said, no, 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 no. I didn't volunteer, I was chosen. It's the work that's voluntary. And specifically there, she means unpaid. On to representational practice. This is a big A. You could say it's existentially critical for NGOs. So the idea that NGOs represent particular groups and advocate for their interests better than local government, better than anyone else. So in this chapter, I try to bring anti-colonial insights to bear on Western representational theory, screening once again for its imperial debris. So I draw from Fanon and later Memi who set out how representational practice, and that could be aesthetic or political, actually brings a, political, a particular group into being. So instead of a, a representative amplifying the needs of a pre-existing group, it's that practice of re representation that brings the group into being. Now they were writing long before the, what's now called a constitutive turn in representational theory, they were also writing before, obviously, Edward Said translated Foucault into post-colonial theory. Um, and I try and use these works to engage with Hannah Pickens' work on representation. It's quite a, a canon in Western uh, representational theory, specifically her ideas of acting for versus standing for others. So for Pitkin, these are um, separate, they're very distinct modalities. You act for someone if you're in a better position to understand their long-term interests, so that is substantive representation, but you stand for somebody if you look like them or if you're close to them, that is called uh, descriptive representation. So in the book, there's lots of stories of um, vignettes of how representational practice um, in reality is an oscillation between these two. So one often collapses into the other and often then into quite problematic tropes. So NGOs, they stand for marginalized groups, but then 
when projects start to fail or the wheels come off or when people don't understand properly, that's when they need to act for them. And in that moment, they become trustees. Trusteeship, as we know, is core to the entire colonial project. Uh, in this quote, an NGO worker, and unusually that she was from the area, and so in the 35 or so NGOs that I spoke to, I only found one or two workers that were actually from Bagamoyo. But even then, she got cross after monitoring because nobody had done the work. These people, she said, she was moaning or lamenting, they just sit. Or you could translate it as they just stay the same, they just remain. So some of these are, in, you know, topical in development policy at the moment. You know, a growing movement to say, just give directly, give money directly, stop the evangelizing, cut out no more workshops, just uh, cut out the middleman entirely. So it's not always that straightforward, but perhaps it could be, you know, trust that people understand their own interests. And the last one then, before I come to a close, I've included... Uh, materiality of information because um yeah i mean it would be a reasonable critique of the book to say you know ideas don't just stand alone they have materialities as well and you can't necessarily have one without the other so i wrote that chapter in response uh, to that that came out of the examination process uh, to sort of look a little bit more at the political economy of development. So it's so much data and material resource for sure that didn't make it in. Um, but I was just keen to focus that legitimation is not something that's just fault necessarily. It's not just this transaction. But I did decide that materialities need more attention. So this chapter explores how uh, actors require authority in the first place to collect data but also how becoming uh, repositories of data itself serves to craft a kind of political authority. And given how fungible data is, people very much understand that in this day and age, it was such a flashpoint uh, for anger and dissent. People were getting very angry when NGOs were trying to collect data, especially over time where the, the reciprocal benefit was not seen to be enough. But also NGOs were getting very unhappy when other NGOs were becoming data houses or experts and owning the data in a particular way. So this is sort of lateral contestation as well. An interesting relationship with local government. Sometimes they were quite happy to outsource monitoring and data collection in particular uh, issue areas, especially human rights, which is notoriously quite difficult to monitor and capture the impact of human rights. So they were sort of saying, no, you, you guys can do that. It's quite contentious as well. Some of the human rights focused activities were quite contentious with local populations. So it was easier for local government to some, sort of outsource some of those data collection activities. So yeah, gathering of information goes to the nub very much of uh, creating and contesting public authority. And I have a new project I was talking about earlier with health volunteers in Kenya, and the defining image, I think, very much is the drive for these health volunteers to produce and collect data, which is an extremely difficult process sometimes, depending on what kind of data. <coughs> and I remember in one meeting, uh, the local government were sort of cracking the whip and saying, look, you've got 120 households, are you telling me you don't have anybody with malaria? And uh, at one point, one woman just said, I can't date it. She said, it's dated every time you come, it's data, data, data. I can't create sick people if I don't have them in my household. <laughs> so I think it, it kind of shows the sort of weird, sort of perverse incentive structures, uh, structures that are now um, being placed on the shoulders of these unpaid workers in the service of uh, the datification of development and these balls find themselves at the bottom of a huge global ecosystem of information gathering and very aware of their uh, the commodification of that information and they're working in that case they're working for free when people are, um, are extremely tired especially when the spoils of data themselves are so unevenly distributed so that's it i don't i don't have a really 
Good day to finish. Don't have a punchy end. I just wanted to tell some stories uh, around the book and um, give you an illustration of some of the theorizing and the anti theorizing um, that went on in its writing. And I hope you get something from that today. I am. Um, I think it's probably going to be my last book talk. <coughs> I've done a few of them, so I'm keen to go out with a bang. So <laughs> thank you so much for your attention today. Thank you.